So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to help you out, okay? I know it's Montreal in English, but here's how you do it in French. You ready? Montreal. Okay? Turn to the person beside you go, Montreal. And you have to do it with a gesture like that because there's drama involved. Montreal. Okay? Just remember that, Pastor Danny, for the future whenever you have somebody else here from Montreal. Yeah. Um, it's been just such a great weekend, and I'm really I'm just so thankful to be here. I really appreciate the invitation, and uh, it's an honor for me to be here. I won't go into the whole thing, but um, I shared yesterday that uh, I have family roots in this church. My, my mom was born and raised in this church, and my grandparents and various aunts and uncles and cousins were all uh, part of this church at one time or another. And so it's a weird little, oh, kind of coming home moment to be here. And so, um, yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm I'm grateful to be here. I want to look in the book of John today, in the Gospel of John. This is my favorite gospel. I know you're not supposed to have favorites, but I do. And it's the Gospel of John. I love out of the four gospels that that gospel, that way that John tells the stories of Jesus. And one of the reasons that I love it is because um, he shows all of these personal encounters uh, that Jesus has, you know, with individual people. And, and each person he responds to differently. Each person is their own person, their own unique person in their own unique space. And Jesus responds to each of them uniquely. And I want to look at one of them today, which is going to be John chapter 4. But I want to set it up for you a little bit, just briefly from the chapter before, because John chapter 3 is the story of one encounter, and John chapter 4 is the story of another encounter, a completely different one. And I think it seems like uh, that when this when these stories were put together in the Gospel of John, that the, the, the writer put them one after another on purpose, okay? And, and I'm going to tie it together and you're going to see it. But there's a contrast between the story in John chapter 3 and the story in John chapter 4. So I'm going to set you up quickly with John chapter 3 and then we're actually going to dive into John chapter 4. We good? You good? Okay. All right. I don't know if you're a church that talks back or not. You can. It won't bother me. If you get really quiet, I'm going to get afraid. So... Yeah, so we're going to, so in John chapter 3, Jesus has um, an encounter, he has a a meeting, uh, an interaction with this guy named Nicodemus. Nicodemus is a religious leader, he's very smart, he's very educated, he has devoted his whole life to following God, he knows scripture, he knows history, he lives right, and he cares about his faith. And Nicodemus visits Jesus. It's very, the scripture is very clear to say he visits him at night. Okay? Now, it may or may not matter, but there's a theme in the Gospel of John of light versus darkness that, that comes out uh, fairly often. And John points out that, that Nick, Nick, Nicodemus visits Jesus at night. He visits him in darkness. It's possible that he's trying to say something about how Nicodemus responds to that, that, that there's a little bit of darkness there. We're not sure. I'll touch on that a little bit later. But he comes to Jesus to chat with him at night and to find out about, uh, find out more about his, his teaching. And so they go back and forth. And some of you have read it and some of you haven't. And if you haven't, you can go home and read it this afternoon because I'm not going to do it today. But, but when you go back and forth, you're reading it. And if you're honest and you actually place yourself in the conversation between Jesus and Nicodemus, you're probably going to be with Nicodemus going, what? <laughs> Which is a lot of what the conversation is. Nicodemus just going, I, what? I don't, I don't really understand what you're saying. And so, so we don't really understand, we don't know in the end how Nicodemus responds to Jesus. They have this conversation, and we just get left hanging at the end of it. There are, are a few references later in Scripture to Nicodemus where, you know, at one point he maybe spoke up to his own colleagues a little bit with a little bit of, of timidity and caution when the hostility got really high against Jesus. He kind of was like, hey, maybe Jesus isn't so bad, but his colleagues shouted him down. And then there's another brief reference in scripture um, that he was joining other secret disciples when Jesus was killed. He joined with them to help bury Jesus. So, so that's it. That's all we know about Nicodemus. It's not exactly earth-shaking, okay? And, but John 3, in the middle of this story of Jesus with Nicodemus, is where probably the most famous Bible verse that you've ever heard is where it says in chapter 3, verse 16, if you know it, you could say it with me, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. Okay? So God so loved who? 
the world, okay? The whole world. And just so you know, it seems that this just goes right over Nicodemus's head, okay? He's like, mm-hmm, yeah, what? And, and so then in John chapter 4, it's like Jesus is like, okay, you know what? I'm just going to show you what this looks like to love the whole world. So chapter 4 in the Gospel of John is a completely different encounter with Jesus. So, so let me just draw the, the contrast for you. Nicodemus in chapter 3 is male. He has all the power in a patriarchal society. And the woman in chapter 4 is female. Okay? No power. He's Jewish. She is Samaritan, meaning she is despised in these circles over here. There's a little bit of racism that's going on and some other stuff. We'll talk about that. Um, he is named in his story. She is not named. He is educated. She very likely is, is not. He has very high status in that society, and she has very low status even for a woman, she has very low status. So, so you, have, you have a little racism, you have a little sexism, you have a little um, elitism, are all part of how these stories end up, end up coming together and how they are, each of these two people are rated in society. So the story with Nicodemus starts, if you remember, in a conversation late at night in the dark, he seeks out Jesus. But this story, this woman's story... It begins with a wide open conversation in the middle of the day, and she stumbles across Jesus, or maybe, in fact, he was seeking her. Let's, let's walk through it together. John chapter 4, starting at verse 3. It says, Jesus left Judea and returned to Galilee. He had to go through Samaria on the way. I'm going to stop right here and tell you that geographically, no, he didn't. <laughs> he didn't. He didn't have to. Most, in fact, most Jewish people would avoid going through Samaria. You didn't want to come in contact with Samaritan people because they considered them to be idolaters, people with the wrong understanding of God, the people with the wrong doctrine. They were also descended from the wrong people, uh, and it's a whole thing that's part of their history and, and all of that stuff. But they had, and so Samaritan people in Samaria, they had built their own temple. They had a different understanding of Scripture. And this has not been forgotten between the two groups. So these two groups, they don't like each other, okay? And, and, and Jewish people did not associate with Samaritans. And so it says that Jesus had to go, he had to go through Samaria. Why? Maybe for this moment, okay? Verse 5. Eventually, he came to the Samaritan village of Sychar near the field that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there. Okay, I want you to notice the references to Jacob. That's, that's ancient history for the Israelite people, for the Jewish people. This is a space that holds historical and religious significance. And the Samaritan people have claimed it. They're like, we have validity. We matter. We're part of descendants of Abraham too. And so that's being emphasized here. So, so uh, Jacob's well was there. And Jesus, tired from the long walk, sat wearily beside the well about noontime. Soon a Samaritan woman came to draw water, and Jesus said to her, please give me a drink. He was alone at the time because his disciples had gone into the village to buy some food. Okay, okay. There's a whole lot that's wrong with this whole picture, okay? First of all, Jesus is in Samaria, which is a bit, bit sketch. It's a little bit questionable, and then you have this woman, and she's drawing water from a well at noon, which is odd, okay? This is not the usual time that women come to draw water from a well, and we don't really know what the reason is. There's, there's, there's books and, and scholars and all the things saying what the reason might be. So she might be, it's possible she might be ostracized in her society. She might be marginalized in her society. She, maybe other women in her town don't want to associate with her. Maybe her reputation is bad. We're going to learn a little bit about that in the rest of the story. So, so there might might be that. She's just trying to come to the well by herself and stay away because everybody doesn't want to be with her anyway. It's possible that that's why she's drawing water at the well at noon. She might be um, approaching for other adult reasons, okay? 
Can I say it that way? She might be approaching the well where a single solitary man is uh, all by herself to offer something, okay? And, and that, that may be the case. And, but before you get too worked up about that, I just want to uh, add that it would be from a very powerless place in society, it would be from a very vulnerable place in society. And so, so we're not going to get all high and mighty about, about her behavior at that moment. She might be just getting water at a weird time of day. She might be just a little bit weird. Is anybody here just a little bit weird? Right? Maybe she just wants to get water in the middle of the... I don't know. It's, it's a bit outside of social norms. So it's a bit... Okay, now, you're going to get all worked up about that. You're going to talk about it over lunch and go, oh, I wonder why she was there. What's the reason that she was there at noon? And here's the thing that I need you to know. It doesn't matter. <laughs> it doesn't matter to the story why she was there. I'm going to give you a spoiler alert right now, and some of you are going to open your Bibles to check to see if I'm right, okay? Spoiler alert, Jesus doesn't call her to repent, Jesus makes no judgment. He doesn't even tell her her sins are forgiven. In fact, there is no mention of her sins. Okay? You can look that up. Check it. So here we are in this weird scenario where Jesus is alone with this woman at a well. He's speaking to a woman, which is gasp-worthy. And, and he's speaking to a Samaritan woman, which is just, <gasps> like, it's wrong. You can't do that. And then he asks her for a drink of water. And you go, well, what's the big deal with that? Like, Jewish people and Samaritan people did not share dishes. They didn't eat together. They don't want to, you know, nobody wants to be contaminated. And so Jesus is asking for her for a drink of water, which is just so everything is wrong with this picture. So in verse 9, the woman was surprised for Jews refused to have anything to do with Samaritans. And she said to Jesus, you're a Jew and I'm a Samaritan woman, you know, in case you didn't notice. Why are you asking me for a drink? And it's a fair question. She's, she's kind of going, ah, this is weird. You're acting weird. And, and then in verse 10, Jesus says, <laughs> Jesus replied, if you only knew the gift God has for you and who you're speaking to, you would ask me, and I would give you living water. And she's like, right. Okay, how many know that right now she's regretting coming to the well at noon? Okay. Okay, she goes. But sir, you don't have a rope or a bucket, she said. And this well is very deep. <laughs> Where would you get this living water? And besides, and then she, she turns it a bit. Besides, do you think you're greater than our ancestor Jacob? Remember we said it was Jacob's well? Do you think you're greater than our ancestor Jacob who gave us this well? How can you offer better water than he and his sons and his animals enjoyed? So she's throwing in a little reference to, you know, I have validity. I'm worth something. But she's also a very practical, very practical woman, okay? She, she's, she's saying the same thing as Nicodemus had said the chapter before, like, how? How are you going to do what you say you're going to do? And she's also taking a little dig at this, at this Jewish teacher going, yeah, you think you're better than our ancestors? So, verse 13, Jesus replied, anyone who drinks this water will soon become thirsty again. But those who drink the water I give will never be thirsty again. It becomes a fresh, bubbling spring within them, giving them eternal life. And she's like, Okay, <laughs> let's, let's just go with it. Maybe if we just have this conversation, this guy will just, you know, settle down, right? Please, sir, the woman said, give me this water, and then I'll never be thirsty again, and I won't have to come here to get water. Now, I don't know. I wasn't there. I cannot read that verse without hearing it in a sarcastic tone of voice. I, like, please, yeah, give me water, and then I'll never have to come here again. I don't know. But, I mean, if, even if it's sincere, what a life change it would be to never have to come back to this well, you know, every day, maybe twice a day, and haul buckets of water. That would be great. So she's like, that'd be great. Can we do that? And so then, and then she says, okay. And Jesus goes, you know, I'm going to change the subject. Go and get your husband, Jesus told her. I don't have a husband, the woman replied. And Jesus said, you're right. You don't have a husband, for you have had five husbands, and you aren't even married to the man you're living with now. You certainly spoke the truth. Now, this is where sometimes we have gotten the story wrong, okay? 
or at least we aren't sure that we've gotten it right. We read Jesus saying, you don't have a husband, you've had five, and you're living with a man now. And we hear, um, we hear it in a tone of voice that says, yeah, that's right, you don't have a husband. You've had five, and the guy you're living with now, not your husband. That's the tone of voice we hear. That's not written in Scripture, okay? And, and we think that Jesus is making a statement of shame or making a statement of sin, telling her, I know about you. I know who you are. I know what you've done wrong. Oh, this woman is an immoral woman with a bad reputation and a big-time sinner. I don't know why we, we read all that into that. That might say more about us than about Jesus because it doesn't say that, okay? And so if you consider the world she lives in, I want to give you, uh, it's a little bit lengthy, but I want to give you a quote from one scholar that just brings this uh, from a different angle. Her name is Dr. Carolyn Lewis. And this is what she, this is her thoughts. This is another angle for you to maybe consider this from. This is, it is not only a statement about her marital status, but it's an assertion about her marginalized status. To have been married five times in ancient Palestine would be evidence of circumstances completely beyond the control of any woman at that time. In order to survive, it was necessary for a woman to be married. Thus, the numerous injunctions in Scripture to care for widows. To have had five husbands could also mean that the woman had been divorced, also often for trivial matters, But more likely, it's quite possible that she was barren. She couldn't have kids. And if she was barren, that would mean that she wouldn't have family to turn to in case of being widowed, which would further exacerbate her dependent status. The fact that she's currently living with a man, not her husband, does not necessarily correspond to a modern-day shacking up or living in sin, it's, it's possible, okay? So this scholar is saying rather for sure. I'm saying it's possible. It's possible that her situation was probably a leveret marriage. So by law, the brother of the dead husband was obliged to take in his dead brother's wife either by formal marriage or by living arrangements of some kind, okay? Now, all of that is one scholar's thoughts about it. But here's what, I, here's what I want you to hear, okay? No matter what the reason is and what the story is, this is a woman living in a patriarchal society. She's been through it, and life has not been kind to this woman. Can we agree on that? Life has not been kind. Even if she's coming to the well all by herself, uh, all alone with a strange man with less than innocent reasons, this is a woman with no husband, in a society where you have to have a husband to survive. She's a woman with no family, and that means she has no power and she has no identity. Because in that society, your identity is not who you are, it's who you belong with. That's how your identity is determined. Who you belong to, who you belong with, who your family is, who your your household is. That's how this society determines your identity, okay? And so even if even if, which we don't know, but even if she has made decisions to do what she needed to do in order to survive, it's from a place of vulnerability and powerlessness. Life has not been kind to this woman, okay? And so when Jesus says that he knows she's had five husbands and her current situation, he's not only telling her that he knows about her, he's telling her that he knows what it is to be her. He knows And that tells her that he's a prophet. So she asks a theological question. Verse 19. Sir, the woman said, you must be a prophet. (laughs) She's not going to talk about the pain, okay? You must be a prophet. So tell me, why is it that you Jews insist that Jerusalem is the only place to worship? Well, we Samaritans claim it's here at Mount Gerizim where our ancestors worship. This is the key issue between the Jewish people and the Samaritans. They each have their own temple. The temple is where God lives. Okay? The temple is the symbol of the presence of God for each of them, and they each have a different place. So the location of God matters in John's gospel. You see it referenced a few times. And watch what Jesus says in verse 21. Jesus replied, believe me, dear woman, the time is coming when it will no longer matter whether you worship the Father on this mountain or in Jerusalem. You Samaritans know very little about the one you worship, while we Jews know all about him, for salvation comes through the Jews. But, 
But, but, the time is coming. Indeed, it's here now when true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. So where a temple is won't matter. And the Father's looking for those who will worship him that way. For God is spirit, so those who worship him must worship in spirit and in truth. Now, let's be fair and go. She probably doesn't understand everything that he's saying, but she knows this is big. She knows, she knows this is important. Her faith matters to her. And, and her God, knowing God, matters to her. And she, she knows, she's figured out that there must be more than what she already knows. And so she's watching for that. She's waiting for that. She's looking for the answers that are there. And so she says in verse 25, the woman said, I know the Messiah is coming, the one who's called Christ. And when he comes, he'll explain everything to us. And then Jesus told her, I am. I am the Messiah. It's me. You don't, you don't need to worry about where the temple should be. Jesus is going because I am where God lives. Verse 28, the woman left her water jar beside the bell, the well, the well, not the bell. She, she left her water jar beside the well and ran back to the village telling everyone, come and see a man who told me everything I ever did. Could he possibly be? the Messiah. So the people came streaming from the village to see him. And I love this phrase, come and see. It's not the first time that we see it in the gospel of John. It's what Jesus had said to John the Baptist, uh, two disciples earlier when they were were thinking of following along. He was like, hey, why don't you come and see? And it's what Philip had said to Nathaniel earlier when he was like, hey, why don't you come and see? And there's this invitation, come and see for yourself, right? And then she, so she says, she goes back to the town and she goes, come and see. And she invites them to come and see it for themselves. And then she's got this question going, do you think it's possible? Is it, do you think he could possibly be? She's not sure. Like she's not, she's not certain, even at this moment. And she's okay with that. She, something important has happened. And she's not sure what to do with it. But it has impacted her enough. She's telling everybody. Okay. Verse 39. Many Samaritans from the village believed in Jesus because the woman had said, he told me everything I ever did. And when they came out to see him, they begged him to stay in their village. So he stayed for two days in a Samaritan village. He stayed there long enough for many more to hear his message and believe. And then they said to the woman, I love this, now we believe not just because of what you told us, but because we've heard him ourselves. Now we know that he is indeed the savior of the world. Now they, this whole Samaritan village, had had an encounter with Jesus too. Samaritans, outsiders, those people had had an encounter with Jesus. They were wrong. I mean, they're wrong. Those are people who are wrong. We all know that those are people who are wrong. It's a whole community of people who are wrong. And there they are just encountering Jesus like they're allowed to. They're just, they're just recognizing and following the Messiah. I mean, this is remarkable. This is, this is huge, okay? Why did it say that Jesus had to go through Samaria? For that. <laughs> for her, for all of them, for that whole village, to demonstrate, okay, now we're going to link it back, to demonstrate what Jesus had explained to Nicodemus in the previous chapter, for God so loved who? Who? For God so loved who? The whole world. Women. Samaritan women, outsiders whose doctrine is wrong. Jesus, the Samaritan woman at the well, and her villagers <laughs> have acted out what God loving the world looks like. So we compare again, you know, Nicodemus, 
secret disciple coming at night, making these tentative statements, helping to bury the body and showing respect. Good job. Good. But her? This unnamed woman? She impacted her whole community. She had an encounter with Jesus, and then she shared it with everyone she knew, and then they each had an encounter with Jesus. And here's the cool thing. Outside of the disciples, she was the first. She was the first one to believe that he was the Messiah. And she was the first one to tell other people. So what do we do with this story, okay? (laughs) What are the takeaways? Number one, hold up a finger, number one, number one. The balcony's not doing it. Like, I can just stay. (laughs) There you go. Number one, you ready? Jesus makes room for women, okay? Like, can I just tell you, really, I despair some days that this even needs to be said. (laughs) But it does. And Jesus loved this woman, and he valued her, and he welcomed conversation with her. He didn't feel that his reputation was put at risk by her. He made time for her. He made room for her. He shifted his plans for her, and he didn't seem to have a problem with her being the one to tell everybody else in the village, men and women, about him. He had no problem with that. And I'm just saying that there are far too many voices out there lately, out there, okay, suggesting that women are less in some way and that how women can be used by God is limited. And Somebody in my church came to me a few months ago. In my church, I'm the lead pastor at my church, and a woman in my church came to me a few months ago, and she said, I need to talk to you. And I said, okay. And so we sat down and we started chatting, and she said, you know, she talked about what her past had been. She had been at the church for years. She had been in another church for years before that, and in the church that she had been in before ours, you know, it had been made very, very clear that she was a little bit less than, and that, you know, uh, her husband was the one that would mediate God to her, and she couldn't hear from God herself. And now she was trying to figure out what that meant. And she was starting to read scripture and she was starting to just see stuff. And she, she was asking me like, how do I, how do I process all of this? And we talked, we chatted back and forth about what we see with women in scripture and all of that. And she finally said, like with such, such nervousness, she said, so, so is God telling me, girl, sit down? And I said, no way. God is telling you, girl, rise up, okay? Because since the dawn of time, somehow, women keep hearing that God says, sit down, you know, be quiet, go home. And that is not the message of Jesus to women. And I talk to my sisters right now and tell you, it doesn't matter if you're a little sketchy. (laughs) It doesn't matter if life has not been kind to you. It doesn't matter if you've had to make hard choices in order to survive. It doesn't matter if you're just a little bit weird getting water at a different time than everybody else. Jesus loves you, and Jesus makes room for you. Jesus will take a detour just for you. And even if the disciples are caught a little off guard by it, and they were, by the way, I just skipped them this morning. But, you know, God loves and empowers and welcomes and values women, and you are not second class, okay? Here's number two. Hold up the fingers. Number two. Jesus loves the whole world. All of it. The whole world. This weekend, with the volunteers and leaders, I talked about how the world has changed. I talked about how Canada has changed and our world has changed. And, you know, there is a lot um, in our world right now, in our society, there is a lot of us and them conversation, right? Us and them, 
right? And it can apply to all different categories. And there's a, but there's a lot of, of language like that in our world, a lot of polarization, a lot of othering people who disagree with us or with whom we disagree. And, and then we say things like, they have an agenda. And they say that about us. And, and then there's claims of why we are right and they are wrong. And there's all of this, you know, us versus them and, and, and we and, and others and all of that and separating it out. And, 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 and we look at this story and we, we look back at even Nicodemus, okay? So Nicodemus in John chapter 3 probably, probably had no capacity to imagine Jesus beyond his own world, his own group, his own circle. That's who the Messiah was for. The Messiah was going to come and the Messiah was going to be just for Jewish people. Certainly not for them. Not for, not for Samaritans. Their doctrine was wrong. <laughs> you know, maybe, maybe for women, but, but, you know, don't get too excited about theology because theology was for men, not for women. And isn't it interesting that Jesus didn't tell this woman whose doctrine and her temple, he didn't tell her. She asked the question, you know, which one's right, which one's wrong. It's kind of where she's going. And Jesus doesn't even answer that. He doesn't even seem to, he doesn't seem to care that much. He's like, I'm not going to answer you about who's right and which temple and what location and who's got the, yeah, yeah, that question, actually, it doesn't matter. <laughs> 2,000 years later, we're still fighting over things like this. Still excluding people that Jesus loves over arguments that might not be as important as we think, okay? I mean, Nicodemus, like, dude, wait till you get to the book of Acts. Like, it's really going to blow your mind because it's going to open it up, and then Gentiles are going to be welcome, everybody. Jesus loves the whole world, all of it, even that group, and those people. And right now you're going, who's she talking about? Whoever comes to your mind when I say that, okay? Don't attribute words to me that I didn't say, okay? <laughs> Jesus loves the whole world. That, that group, those people, the, one who, the ones who you think have an agenda, the ones that you can barely tolerate sharing a meal with, the ones that you dismiss, or that worse, you degrade behind closed doors. And you know who I mean, because all of you have somebody in your head right now, and I'm telling you, Jesus loves them. And he will go out of his way to connect with them. And therefore, we need to as well. We, we should be going out of our way as followers of Jesus to make sure that there is nobody who thinks that God hates them. We, we should be willing to sit and chat with somebody that's going to make somebody else do a double take. Oh, I can't believe they're sitting with that person and talking to them. We should be doing that. We should be awfully careful using us and them language that designates who's in and who's out. Because I don't see Jesus trying to identify and define who's excluded. I see him broadening the circle and welcoming people to come and see. Come and see. One of my favorite people in the world is is Bill Morrow. I love him. He's one of my mentors. He's, he's a pastor. He's, he's been a superintendent and a Bible college president. He's done all the things. And, and he's a good friend of mine. And, and, you know, I've talked with him about this a few times. And you know what he says to me several times? He says, Patty, the problem is I haven't yet met a person that Jesus doesn't love. <laughs> I haven't yet met a person that Jesus doesn't love. And all the other stuff, well, that's God's to work out, not mine. Our job is to tell them Jesus loves them. And so today, here's what I want to do. <laughs> I want to remind you, okay? I want you to hear this. Jesus loves you. And some of you have been here for decades some of you might be here for the very first time today, and Jesus loves you. Jesus came for you. If you need Jesus to come out in the middle of the night and have a secret conversation, like he'll do that. He'll make a detour through a sketchy place to meet with you. 
And I'm going to invite you to just bow your heads at this moment because I want to I just talk with you and let it just be a personal moment. So if, if you're comfortable, you know, bow your heads, close your eyes, just to create a little personal space and, and try to hear and let it sink in what I'm saying this morning. You are so loved. You, you matter so much. And I just want to invite you to pause and breathe that in and welcome that in for a moment. And some of you are going, yes, it's really good she's saying that. People need to hear it. You need to hear it as well. Hear the voice of the Holy Spirit saying to you, you are so loved. You matter so much. And we get, we get so busy and we get so tired, and sometimes we feel threatened or afraid, and we put a little shield over our hearts, and we just, we just forget this, that we're loved. This morning, I was, I was in my room and just prepping for this morning and, and, and doing my own devotional time, and you know what I read was in Matthew chapter, 20, chapter 10, some other words of Jesus where he said, what's the price of two sparrows? One coin? But not a single sparrow can fall to the ground without your father knowing it. And the very hairs on your head are all numbered, so don't be afraid. You're more valuable to God than a whole flock of sparrows. You, you are so loved. And here's the second thing that I want you to hear. First, you are so loved. And second, so are they. That person, those people, that group that you struggle with, they are so loved just like you. And they matter so much. And if if Jesus was willing to go out of his way and go through Samaria for the sake of this woman and her village, surely to goodness, we can cross the street. <laughs> surely to goodness, we can cross town. If Jesus was willing to take a drink and be served by somebody he wasn't even supposed to associate with, then surely we can share a meal with them too because they are loved by God and it's our job to tell them so. And so, Lord, we pause and reflect on that this morning. And for some of us, we maybe haven't heard or it just hasn't sunk in for a long time. You are so loved and and it's a lot, you know. There's so many voices that tell us everything different, tell us we're not good enough, we don't measure up, and if only you knew, and all of that stuff. And Jesus knew, and he still loved her. And so, Lord, we, we, we choose, those of us that need to this morning, we choose to receive your message, your voice, your words that say, you are so loved. Can I just encourage you, you know, if this matters for you and this is an important moment, even just whisper right under your breath, I am so loved. I am so loved because you are, and it's true. And there is nothing that can make God love you less, and there is nothing that can make God love you more. You are loved by God. And then we reflect a little further. And for some of us, you know, we've, we're not, maybe not proud of it or we're not sure how we feel about what this visiting preacher just said. But there was definitely a group or a person or a whatever that came to mind. And we need to talk to you about that and go, I know that you love them and I'm struggling with that. So Jesus, would you help us to have the courage to talk? to you about that. But Lord, I'm asking, I'm begging you, give us your heart for people. Even when we don't know what to do, even when there's disagreement, even when we struggle, even when it's uncomfortable, even when it makes other people do a double take, Lord, 
I mean, you love them. And would you give us your heart for people so that that's our first thought, even as we navigate all the various complexities and the things that are going on, would you give us your heart and help us to to interact with them and navigate all this from a place of absolute confidence that each one is somebody that you love so much? And would you make us people then that carry that into our world? Make us people that walk in the security of knowing that we are loved by God and then give that away generously and freely with kindness so that others may know as well that you are loved. God, I pray that you would bless each one, that you would help us to continue to walk in the love and the grace that you give us. And we ask all of this in Jesus' name. Amen.